Did you know that there are many examples in the Bible of people living in the country? Man's original home was Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 2, 8 tells the story. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Then the Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. You know, there's something wonderful about living out in the country. Uh, God designed people in the very beginning for country living. He took the first man and he put him in a garden. There's just something about being out in nature surrounded by the things that God made that is so much better for our bodies and our souls. The Bible tells about Enoch, Genesis 5, verse 18 to 24. Jared lived 162 years and begat Enoch. Enoch lived 65 years and begat Methuselah. After he begat Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Hebrews 11.5 looks in the rearview mirror and tells us about Enoch from the New Testament perspective. Hebrews 11 says, By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death, and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had a testimony that he pleased God. Ministering to the Cities book, page 11, adds some more insights about Enoch. Enoch walked with God, and yet he did not live in any city polluted with violence and wickedness. It continues and says, He did not make his abode in the wicked city. He placed himself and his family where the atmosphere would be as pure as possible. Then at times he went forth to the inhabitants of the world with his God-given message. After proclaiming this message, he always took back with him to his place of retirement some who had received the warning. Now isn't that interesting? Enoch lived in the country, but he ministered in the cities, and when he had converts, he would bring them back to his home in the country. Wise plans are to be laid in order that work may be done in the best possible advantage. More and more as wickedness increases in the great cities. We should have to work them from outpost centers. This is the way Enoch labored in the days before the flood, when wickedness was rife in every populous community, and when violence was in the land. Country Living, page 30. As God's commandment keeping, keeping people, we must leave the cities as did Enoch. We must work in the cities, but not dwell in them. The next patriarch in the Bible that we find living in the country is Abraham. Genesis 12, 1 and verse 4 says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get up out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abraham was seventy-five years old when he departed from Haran. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he had received as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, 
the heirs with him of the same promise for he waited for the city which has foundation whose builder and maker is god hebrews 11 8 through 10 so we can see that Abraham lived in tents. He didn't live in the city. He chose not to live in the city because his city that he was waiting for was the new Jerusalem. Genesis 26, 12 to 14 then tells the story of Isaac. Then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him. And the man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous, for he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great number of servants. Then we have Jacob, Genesis 28, 12 and 13. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on earth, and it to its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of gods were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, and the land on which you lie I will give you and your descendants. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 187, elaborates. Jacob awoke from his sleep, and in the deep stillness of night, the shining forms of his vision had disappeared. Only the dim outline of the lonely hills above them, the heavens bright with stars, now met him, met his gaze. But he had a solemn sense that God was with him. We now have the story of Moses, who also lived in the country. Exodus 2, verses 15 and 16. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water, and they filled the troughs to water their father's flock. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 247, explains, The Lord directed his course, and he found a home with Jethro the priest and the prince of Midian who was also a worshiper of God. After a time, Moses married one of the daughters of Jethro, and here, in the servants of his father, service of his father-in-law, as keeper of his flocks, he remained for 40 years. So here we have Moses being a shepherd out in the wilderness. The book Education, page 63, says, Amidst the solemn majesty of the mountain solitudes, Moses was alone with God. Everywhere the Creator's name was written. Here Moses gained that which went with him throughout the years of his toilsome and care-burdened life, a sense of a personal pre presence of the Divine One. Exodus 3, 1 and 2. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. Then we have later after the Exodus and the wilderness journey of the Israelites, we have the promise of the promised land of Canaan. And Caleb and Joshua were among the spies that went to see this land that God was giving to them. And then we have the story of David. We know he was a shepherd and that he was uh, able to protect his sheep out in the wilderness. And we have the story of Amos. He was a sheep herder, a sycamore fig farmer, and prophetic message for the cities of Samaria and Bethel. So here again, we have a prophet of God who lived in the wilderness, but worked the cities from remote. And then of course, there's John the Baptist, probably lived the most primitive of any of these examples. He lived in the desert wilderness and he ate locusts and wild honey. 
And then we have the disciples of Jesus. The first disciples were fishermen from the Sea of Galilee. And then when the 12 were all, all selected, um, they traveled with Jesus from place to place. Jesus spent most days, he would find at the end of the day, a quiet and solitude place in the hills where he could commune with his father. So we have a call for us today to move from the cities and move into the country and yet be in a position to minister to the lost humanity in these populated areas. Country Living, page six. It is not God's purpose that people should be crowded into cities, huddled together in terraces and tenements. In the beginning, he placed our first parents amid, amidst the beautiful sights and sounds he desires us to rejoice in today. The more nearly we come into harmony with God's original plan, the more favorable will be our position to secure a healthy body and mind and soul. Now let's take a look at the cities in the Bible. The first city is found in Genesis 4, verse 16 and 17. We're talking about the, the son of Adam and Eve. Then Cain went out of the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. This is a different Enoch than the one that we think about that walked with God. This one was before the other Enoch. Cain built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. So the first city in recorded history in the Bible was the, the city of Enoch, which was named after Cain's son. Enoch is believed to have been the largest city in the world at its height. 40,000 residents with about 80,000 people living in the surrounding areas. These were city-states, which was quite a feature in the uh, southern Mesopotamia area over the years. Hence the need felt by Moses to mention Cain's city in the Bible. Now, the city of Enoch, as a side note, has uh, consequently been, uh, as, you, as you know, if we think about it, the city of Enoch was not God's plan. Cain is the one who killed Abel, and Cain was a marked man. And so he fled uh, away from um, the Garden of Eden area and, and in a defense built this city. So the city was really built on uh, bad principles. It was not done in a, because God wanted it done. So it doesn't surprise me that we get some other um, applications of the name Enoch for a city that aren't necessarily a good connotation. Here's an example. These are the writings of Jess Hill, who was a science fiction writer, and he tells in one of his novels about the city of Enoch as part of the other world. Well, we know there isn't an other world like he's talking about. So this is not a positive, uplifting New Jerusalem kind of city. This is a science fiction uh, city of a demonic kind of nature. And here's another example, the underworld. Enoch is the name given to the city of the dead. It is located in the upper reaches of the underworld. It is often hailed as the way station for ghosts entering the underworld. So you can see Satan had his hand in developing the idea of having a city at the beginning of uh, Adam and Eve's lifespan with Cain starting the city of Enoch. And then the Satan has used this name of a city to spin it during our day. And I believe there's even um, a video game that uses a city of Enoch. Um, the Mormon church also claims to uh, 
uh, have a city of Enoch. They say, as a leader and a prophet of the people of God, Enoch, now this is the Enoch that walked with God they're talking about, met personally with the Lord on many occasions throughout his 365-year ministry. We know, the Mormons say, this because Enoch received many visions from God and walked with him, as they quote the Doctrine of the Covenant book, page 107, and talked with God face to face, according to the book Moses, uh, chapter, uh, page 7. During his ministry, they say, Enoch also built a city for the people of God, or the people who repented and were baptized. This city, whose inhabitants would later be translated, was known as the city of Enoch. So what Mormons believe is that in their history, that, that uh, Enoch, who walked with God, built a city, which the Bible doesn't have a record of that, um, and that this city was for the purpose of all of its inhabitants to be translated with Enoch to heaven. And they believe those were all uh, Latter-day Saint Mormons. So then the city that we all think of as the first major city is Babylon. Babylon was such an important large city that uh, we see it symbolically used throughout the Bible, clear into the end of Revelation, as the opposite of the New Jerusalem. So Genesis 11, verse 4, And they said, this is after the flood, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower, whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the earth. It is believed that Babylon was the first city to reach a population of 200,000. And of course, it was dismantled by God, and the very thing they feared of being scattered all over the earth is exactly what God made happen by confusing their voices. And to this day, we say Babel means making not sense because of the languages. And then we have the story of Lot and Sodom. Genesis 13, 9 and 10. Please separate from me. This is, this is Abraham talking to Lot. If you take the left, then I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I will go to the left. And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all of the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere like a garden of the Lord. Then Lot chose for himself all of the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward. And they separated from each other. Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan. And Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. Country Living, page 30. When an iniquity abounds in a nation, there is always to be heard some voice giving warning and instruction, as the voice of Lot was heard in Sodom. Yet Lot could have preserved his family from many evils had he not made his home in this wicked, polluted city. Country Living, page 30. All that Lot and his family did in Sodom could have been done by them, even if they lived some distance away from the city. And of course, God destroyed the city, and he lost his wife to a pillar of salt. And the wickedness of the city even influenced him and his daughter's judgment. And then we have the story of the city of Nineveh, Genesis 10, 8 through 11. Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. And the beginnings of his kingdom are Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar. From that land, he went to Assyria and built the city of Nineveh. Jonah 3.3 3 describes Nineveh as an exceedingly great city of three days' journey in breadth. 
That means if you were walking, it would take you three days to get from one side of the city to the other. That's a pretty good sized city. The prophet Jonah gave his description. Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons. Now, Nineveh was warned of its destruction in 40 days. And of course, we know the city repented and God held off on the destruction. But the city returned to evil and 40 years later, it was destroyed after all. Country Living, page five. Instead of the crowded city, seek some retired situation where your children will be, so far as possible, shielded from temptation, and there train and educate them for usefulness. Go to where you can look upon the works of God. Find rest of the spirit in the beauty and the quietude and the peace of nature. Well, friends, it is possible to live completely off the grid and be fairly comfortable. Uh, it takes some wisdom, it takes some planning, and I'll admit I'm a little conflicted because we have a great work in the city. Uh, the people, most of the people in the world now live by the centers of population. But the Bible tells us that someday, Matthew chapter 24, the abomination that makes desolate will be set up and those that be in Judea, Jesus says, flee into the mountains. There'll be a time we need to flee. You pray, I mean, you know, it's not wise for a person to just say, I'm gonna sell everything I have and go move to the hills. You need to be practical, you need to make sure that you have a way to support yourself and you don't lose your opportunity to witness to the people where they are. I'd like to end with a little bit of uh prophetic perspective on the cities. This is an Ellen White quote that's from Manuscript 114, uh, 1899, uh, Fifth Manuscript Release 305, Paragraph 4. In India, China, Russia, and the cities of America, thousands of men and women are dying of starvation. The moneyed men because they have the power, control the market. They purchase at low prices all they can obtain and then sell at greatly increased prices. This means starvation to the poorer classes and will result in a civil war. There will be a time of trouble such as never been since there was a nation. And at that time, shall Michael stand up, the great prince with stand standeth for the children of thy people and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time and at that time thy people shall be delivered every one who's found written in the book many will be purified and made white and tried but the wicked will do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand but the wise shall understand now this is talking about the large cities in the future so notice, first of all, it mentions India, China, Russia, and the cities of America, but it also says there will be, future tense, a civil war, referring to these countries. Now, the civil war in America ended in 1865, but this was written in 1899. So the civil war in America was already past history. So this isn't talking about the cities in America will have a civil war back in the 1800s. It's talking about the future. You'll also notice that in 1899, India, China, Russia, and the United States were not much uh, such world powers as they are today. You'll also notice that the largest cities in these four countries are much larger than they were in 1899. Now notice the moneyed men, because they have the power, they're increasing, they, right now we're seeing an increasingly more wealthy 
upper end and a more poor lower end. More homeless people, more wealthy people. We have many billionaires and uh, Elon Musk is getting close to being the first trillionaire. But the context of this is talking about a time of trouble such as there never was since there was a nation. So this is talking about in the future, this is going to happen. This civil war in these countries is going to be in the future, not in 1800s. These worldwide civil wars will be during the little time of trouble. Country living, page 24. <clears throat> Parents can secure small homes in the country with, where, with a land for cultivation. On such places, the children will not be surrounded by the corrupting influences of city life. God will help his people to find such homes outside the cities. <clears throat> Those of you who are trying to make that move out of the cities, take courage with this line, God will help his people to find such homes outside the cities. But notice it says a small home in the country. It might be that this process will be a downstep in terms of size of house and amenities and conveniences. So that concludes this topic. Uh, and next week's topic will be the sign for leaving the cities. <clears throat>